that biodiversity is not just this abstract concept uh, in halls of science. It's a, it's it's the living underpinning of our lives, and we are all intimately and directly connected uh, to the the services and the and the resources that biodiversity supplies us in our lives. We we are reliant on the web of biodiversity for our lives. It's it's daunting, it's challenging, but I also think it's exciting. I think this is going to be one of the great issues of our era, and I think uh, in a hundred or two hundred years, when lots of our geopolitical melodramas have uh, been forgotten, I actually think the world is going to um, uh, judge this moment that we're in now very much on how we grappled with this issue. So it's exciting to be a part of it at the same time. Hello and welcome to Studio Talk, coming to you live from New York City. I'm Mike Morris, and on this fully interactive web TV show, I'm joined by two of the key figures driving the UN's response to the planet's loss of biodiversity. Ahmed Jogloff is Executive Secretary of the CBD, and Monique Barbu is CEO and Chair of the Global Environment Facility. Welcome to the show, and thank you both for joining me. I know you have very, very busy schedules with the uh, UN having the General Assembly in town, and thank you very much. Good morning. We have dozens of questions from uh, our viewers. We'll get to those in just a few minutes. We, uh, we are live today, so if you have any questions for either of our guests, please use the box on your screen. Or if you're tweeting while watching the show, please use the hashtag UNBiodiversity. We'll put your questions straight to them. Now, we've already had dozens of questions from all around the world. We'll do our very best to answer as many as we can in the next half hour. Now, before we get into detail, we should provide our viewers with some additional background. Now, Ahmed, I have a question for you. What, uh, can you briefly explain what we mean by this very technical sounding term, biodiversity? Why is it so important? Uh, biodiversity is a scientific word uh, to reflect uh, life. And I think if I have to translate biodiversity in another term, say biodiversity is life, and uh, biodiversity is our life. It's the food, uh, the, the water, uh, the plants, uh, the animals, the interaction uh, with the habitat, with the ecosystem. So without biodiversity, there is no life on Earth. Just a, a crucial, absolutely, completely important thing that we have to deal with. Absolutely. Yeah. Monique, this is clearly very important, as Ahmed just mentioned to us, but why should governments and businesses care about this, uh, particularly during this well-known and very long economic downturn that we have? Biodiversity is an economic value also. <clears throat> it is the main asset of many of the countries. I mean, this is how you sustain your water. This is how you sustain your food. So for government, it's something that you have to protect. And as for many companies in the world, uh, it is actually the supply chain. And as you know, supplies drive the value, the value drives for the, for the investment. And if you take something, for example, like cotton or any kind of uh, goods that you are uh, using in this world, it comes with something which comes from nature, so the biodiversity. And that is why it is a very important item to protect and to sustain. Now, the reason why we've asked you here, and, and again, thank you for uh, cutting us a little slice of your schedule this very busy week. The reason why we've asked you here is because you're experts on this subject. So we have our first viewer question, which I'd like to put to you. It is from Gustavo Merchen, and it would be, what would the easiest way to explain to somebody that's foreign to this issue why biodiversity is so crucial to human life? Uh, Ahmed? As I said, without biodiversity, there is no life on Earth. Uh, it's crucial for our food. It's crucial for our medicine. Uh, the two-thirds of all uh, the, the drugs manufactured in the U.S. are derived from, uh, from, uh, from plants and from genetic resources. Uh, so without biodiversity, there is no life. So it's as if you ask why it's important uh, to protect life on Earth. Monique, somebody's from Mars. They've never heard of biodiversity. Chime in on that. What, why is this so important to all of us, to the whole human community? It is actually uh, your, your, the life of every single human being that you are protecting towards that. Let me give you an example. A uh, few years ago, I mean about 30 years ago, there was a big uh, uh, medical company, 
which found out that with a plant which was only in Madagascar, which was called in French la pervenche bleue, that this plant, when they used it and used the substract of the plant, it was the, the, the main way for them to find what has become the main medicine against cancer at the time. We would not have found that plant, the main treatment of tr cancer, the first treatment of cancer, will not have been there for millions and millions of people. So this is where, I mean, clearly, we don't know yet in all the plants, in all the species which exist, which one are vital for our survival as, as a species today. And so we need to protect all of them. We're looking for that little diamond in, in all those plants, and this is the reason why this is so important. Exactly. Very, very nice. We actually have a short film here made by the Vancouver Film School that illustrates the very importance of biodiversity. Take a look. Life on this planet is made up of a beautiful but very fragile web of interconnected species and environments. We call this biodiversity, and it is the collection of all the different genes, species, and ecosystems in a region. The Earth has 895 separate ecological regions. They are home to over 4,000 different species of mammals, 270,000 species of plants, and 950,000 species of insects. The more biologically diverse the region, the better its chances of survival. We can think of biodiversity in three ways. Genetic biodiversity measures how much variety there is in the gene pool of a particular species. When threatened by disease, those species with a more diverse gene pool are more likely to produce individuals who are able to survive and procreate. Those with smaller gene pools can be wiped out forever. The same principle holds true for species diversity. The more kinds of species in a particular ecosystem, the more likely it is to overcome threats such as natural disasters and climate change. Finally, ecosystem diversity measures the number and variety of different ecosystems in a region. The more diverse the region, the more likely it is for life to survive there when catastrophic events occur. Human beings have a peculiar relationship with biodiversity. On the one hand, we rely on a large variety of species in our environment to help keep our water clean, regulate our climate, control pests and disease, and provide us with food, shelter, clothing, and medicine. <laughs> but human beings today tend to work against biodiversity. Even though there are over 80,000 species of plants that are potentially edible, we choose only 30 of them to supply 90% of the calories in our diet. Just 14 animal species make up 90% of our livestock, and we've only tested 1% of the plants in the world's rainforest for their potential medicinal value, even though half our medicine is made from natural substances. The choices we make in our farming, logging, and urban development are crowding out a lot of the species that make up the biodiversity on our planet. And because these species are so interdependent, when one gets wiped out, it can cause other ones to disappear too. And if we're not careful, one day one of those species might just be us. We are live from New York City discussing biodiversity. Now, as we just saw from that excellent film, biodiversity is not just some big long word. It represents the fabric of our life. To both of you, I would ask the question, what are we doing to manage biodiversity both globally and with individual countries? Ahmed? We have requested the government of the world last year to send us a report on how they are managing biodiversity. Because at the World Summit on Sustainable Development, which is, was 10 years after Rio Summit, uh, the heads of states and government took the commitment to reduce the loss of biodiversity by 2010, last year. So we asked the government to report on how they have implemented what we call the Joanesbo uh, target. I can assure you, Mike, that there is not a single country in the world, including the United States of America and big uh, country of the OECD, that have claimed that they have stopped or reduced the rate of loss of biodiversity. All of them, without any exception, said that the rate of loss of biodiversity is quite at the opposite. It's, it's, in, and it's increasing. 
and the rate of loss of biodiversity today may be 1,000 times higher than the rate, natural rate of extinction. So it is a really a waking call, and therefore in Japan, the international community have decided to take measures to stop uh, and to address this loss of biodiversity. Fascinating information. Now, Monique, we are in New York City. Outside, uh, the General Assembly is, is gathering at the UN, people from countries all over the world. From your opinion, what do you think we're doing globally and individually in these countries to manage biodiversity? Well, globally, uh, because uh, not everything is a sad story, uh, we have achieved uh, to have uh, a 10 percent protection of all the terrestrial uh, uh, planet. So uh, each country has taken commitment and we have helped them to make sure that they could protect this territorial uh, biodiversity. We are now taking other commitments on everything which is marine biodiversity, which is also extremely important. I mean, all the fish that we eat uh, is something which is predominant into the health system. And so the next target that we are fixing now is on the marine biodiversity. And those are the global target, and we are helping into those. Now, into individual countries, you have countries which have done much more than other. Let me give you the example of a country like Bhutan, very small country, as you know, uh, between India and China. This country has protected 50% of its territory. So it's a very important uh, commitment that the government of this country has been taken and they are doing it because they are thinking about the next generations. And, and as our friend Edward Norton says, we just saw on the, uh, on the tape at the beginning of the show, this is a very important time. People will look back and, and, and realize now is the time. And if you've been listening to this and still don't appreciate the seriousness of the situation, take a look at this. Everywhere we look, we see species disappearing forever, perhaps a thousand times faster than the natural rate. 42% of amphibian species and 40% of bird species are declining in population, while 23% of plant species are threatened. Because of overfishing, yields have been decreasing yearly and about 14% of fish stocks have completely collapsed. We see entire ecosystems woven from the fabric of countless interconnected species severely damaged. And we see the tragic human cost of biodiversity loss. Hundreds of millions of people depend directly on coral ecosystems for their food and livelihoods yet the reefs are bleached and dying. Although we are all affected by the loss of biodiversity, the poor are the most vulnerable, since they often rely directly on nature's resources. Some worrying statistics there. And it, what it brings to the thought that what can we do to change the situation? You know, Monique, um, many people are least aware of the, the terms climate change. You ask 10 people on the street, eight of them will know that. I don't think that same statistic would hold true for biodiversity. Why do you think there's such little recognition of this very important term? Well, um, climate change uh, uh, has become uh, some, uh, an issue that everybody recognizes because climate change has found a way to measure the problem, which is the CO2 emissions question. And so everybody can, with a very single uh, item, recognize what is it that we are talking about. The problem with biodiversity is that biodiversity is everything. And so there is not one simple indicator which will help you to say this is how you measure that you are doing good or you are not doing good for biodiversity. And so the issue is much more complex and very difficult then to make it understand by the general public. Although at the same time, because it is really the condition of our 
species, human species being on life, people should be much more aware of uh, the problems which is caused by the biodiversity. But again, we are struggling to find the right indicator which will allow us to translate into real terms what it is and how you measure it. And it would help if people had your passion, I can tell you that. Ahmed, I have a, a question that comes to us from Malacca Rodrigo in Sri Lanka. As we said, we're a worldwide broadcast. What are your specific plans to get governments and communities of biodiversity-rich developing uh, countries to commit more on conservation during the UN decade of biodiversity? Talk about plans. Plans, I think, as I said, in Nagoya, Japan, uh, last year, in October, the international community as a whole, 193 parties and their partner, so 18,000 participants, the business community, the mayors of the world, the parliamentarian, the youth, the children, the scientists, have agreed on 20 strong, ambitious targets, including the one referred to by Monique, to increase the current rate of protected area, for example, terrestrial, from the current rate of, say, 12, 13% to 17% by 2020. Marine protected area, as, Marie, as uh, Monica said, from the current rate of 1% to, 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 to 10% by uh, 2020. Uh, awareness, for example, they have agreed that at the latest by 2020, all the people of the world, the seven, uh, seven billion people by October, will be aware about biodiversity, will value biodiversity, and will protect biodiversity. Thus, the UN General Assembly has declared 2011, 2020, as the UN decade on biodiversity, in order to engage all the people of the world in the fight to protect life on Earth. So now this plan is a UN plan, not only for one convention, the International Convention on Biological Diversity, but for the whole UN family as a whole, as a whole, without any exception. And now the government are requested to translate these 20 targets into national priorities and plan of action. So it's not only something which is going to be, to be kept in the shelves of the library of the UN, but it is being translated. And some countries like France, like the European Union, like the United Kingdom, have already done it to translate this into a national plan of action and uh, strategies to be implemented before 2020. And some are enacting some laws and regulations to do it. To come back to the good example of, uh, of Monique uh, about some countries, Seychelles, for example, uh, Bhutan, 25%. Seychelles president has announced last week that half of the Seychelles, 50% of all the territory of Seychelles will be protected. And these are really good news coming. Monique, let's, let's ask you a question. We do have a question here from Nayanika Singh. The, uh, how is it possible to get the United States involved? I mean, what do all these initiatives mean if a global power like the United States of America is not involved? Well, um, I want to say very clearly that I do not uh, share this statement. It is true that the U.S. have not signed the Biodiversity Convention, and it is true that it would be much nicer if they could sign it. But at the same time, U.S. is the main funder of biodiversity project in the world. The Global Environment Facility, which I am uh, chairing, is the financial mechanism of the convention. And the US is my number one donor. So actually, they are doing a lot. They have not translated it in legal terms by ratifying the convention, but in terms of how they are helping the countries and uh, how much financial means the U.S. government is putting into protecting biodiversity, this is uh, not a statement uh, that I share to say that they are not doing a lot. Uh, a follow-up question on that, Monique. Obviously, this is going to cost a lot of money. How will the GEF help? Well, uh, GEF has uh, so far invested more than $3 billion already in biodiversity conservation, and we have raised uh, another $9 billion of co-financing towards those activities. And we are going to be doing even more in the years to come. And we are doing it by also linking the subject. You were talking about climate change. Right. 
But, you know, one of the main problem of the climate change is that uh, you have now to find ways to adapt all the different ecosystems to what is happening. And all this work of adaptation of the ecosystem is something that GF is very heavily financing, for example. I have a question here from Rebecca Nesbitt. Business and biodiversity can't afford to be enemies. Do you have any examples of businesses who have increased their profit by protecting biodiversity? These can be an inspiration to others. Ahmed? Um, we have an example where a business that have embraced, embraced uh, uh, biodiversity and environment have tremendously increased their income. As you know, we like it or not, tomorrow market will be green. It will not be green by uh, choice or by luxury, uh, but it will be green by necessity. We are, I think, doomed to live in a warmer and warmer planet, a more and more populated population, and with very uh, limited scale resources. So the business that are already engaged in preparing and investing in the market of tomorrow are the ones that are going to survive tomorrow. And those that are failed to see the trends of tomorrow will have, unfortunately, to close uh, the door. So we have a huge uh, initiative, we call it Business and Biodiversity, uh, where uh, the business are being engaged uh, in uh, trying to mainstream biodiversity in their, in their activities. And this includes, of course, the U.S. business. But I fully agree with Monique about the fact that the U.S. is engaged when it comes to the protection of uh, uh, biodiversity in general, environment. But uh, as the executive secretary of the biodiversity, I do believe that uh, the convention will continue to be unfulfilled unless we have the U.S., the United States of America, as a full-fledged party and joining the big family of nations and working together to address this unique challenge that we are faced with, mainly to protect life on Earth for us and for the generation to come. Excellent word to use in your answer, family. Modi, jump in there. Yes, I, I wanted to maybe give uh, an example on business. Let me give you the example of Walmart. And uh, Walmart... For those, very quickly, for those who may not know, Walmart, a very, very large global company. One of the largest company of the world, a big retailer company Correct. of the world. Walmart, uh, 20 years ago, started, you know, to buy some uh, organic cotton. And uh, actually, uh, this organic cotton, because they bought it uh, in, in um, quantity, which were maybe bigger than smaller uh, company could buy it, came to a price which was not so high inside their retail shop. And the sales of this organic cotton have increased dramatically in Walmart. So the CEO of Walmart, looking at it, and at the time uh, in Walmart, they didn't have a sustainability type of things like we do have them now, decided that because he was making so good money into this organic cotton, he was going to increase all the big lines of a product which will be um, uh, uh, bio-based. Uh, and so today, for example, Walmart is the biggest retailer of the world of organic cotton. And people do not buy it much more expensive than other cotton, and Walmart is making good money into this bio-cotton. So you, you have those kind of trade-off which uh, can happen. Also another example, we have just launched with private sector an initiative called SOS, Save Our Species, by which we are asking companies to come with us, to put resources with us, to protect different animal species through the world. And uh, against this help that companies are giving us, we are giving them also product that they can use in the communication uh, towards uh, their clients. For example, Nokia has associated with us and we are right now putting up a different number of programs that Nokia can use for their own uh, advertisement uh, through the world. Excellent examples and that's why we invited you here. 
Now, remember, the show is live from New York City right now. If you want to get your questions in to either of our guests, do so by using the box on your screen or tweet using the hashtag UN Biodiversity because we'll be putting them to Ahmed and Monex next. And welcome back. Monique, we have a question for you from Miko Tadilovic, the deputy uh, news editor at SciDev.net. What role can biodiversity play in alleviating poverty in developing countries? A, a fascinating, important question. Well, for many very poor people, biodiversity is their wealth. And uh, uh, there is uh, something on top which has been agreed in Nagoya which is very, very important. It's a new protocol called the Access and Benefit Sharing Protocol, ABS. And this protocol will uh, actually allow that when a company is making money out of a product which comes from one of the poor collectivities, it will have to share the benefit of this uh, product with those poor communities. So most of the time in the world, actually the very poor are, I will say, the stewards of all this global biodiversity in the world. And it is important that because they are stewards of this biodiversity, we pay them for the work they do for the global community inside the world. And so those are the means that we are trying to develop now into all the projects that uh, we are financing to make sure that the local collectivities, the poorest of them, are getting the benefit of the exploitation of this biodiversity. Monique, thank you. And before the show, you asked us, are we going to get questions? And believe me, we are getting <laughs> questions pouring in from all over the world. Ahmed, uh, the first one that I want to ask you is from Pablo Barrientos Wells. As architect, how can I promote biodiversity in planning? If I have ideas to improve the relationship between communities and the environment, can act coordinated with your activities? How can this be put together to coordinate all this? Absolutely. As uh, you know, we are living in a more and more urbanized uh, environment. Uh, I think uh, two years ago, we had uh, a paradigm shift in humanity more people are living in cities than in rural areas. By far. By far. Uh, I think so far we have more than 400 million, uh, 400 uh, cities with more than 1 million inhabitants. Mm -hmm. In China alone, we will have uh, very soon uh, 400 new cities of more than 1 million inhabitants. By 20, 20, 2050, two-thirds of humanity will be living in cities. And by the end of century, 90% uh, of humanity will be living in cities. How we construct how we build these new cities, I think, will determine the future, I think, of humanity. And we are of the strong belief uh, that uh, the battle for protecting life on Earth will be won or will be lost in the cities. I was last week with uh, 20 mayors in Bonn, and I learned that only in Germany, every day, 95,000 hectares are lost uh, for urbanization and transport and what have you. So therefore, we have to ensure that this urbanization and of course the new building, the construction, that the road that we are going to, to, to construct and what have you, will be in harmony with nature and not against nature. So therefore, we have launched a big initiative. We call it Cities and Biodiversity, and where the cities of the world will commit themselves to protect biodiversity and plan of action will be adopted, including a special index to monitor the biodiversity. We call it Singapore Urban Biodiversity Index, which is now monitored in more than 54 cities. Unfortunately, we don't have any city from the US, which is part of this uh, global network. And we hope that uh, many cities will uh, make sure that their growth will be in harmony with nature. Ahmed, I have a two for one, as they, as they call it. Uh, and the first one is from Thomas in Poland. What's the main reason the 2010 target in halting biodiversity loss has not been achieved? Second one is from Anan Ananya. Ananya, hi, I'm from Pakistan. Are you sure that the UN will be able to get from the decade of biodiversity? Uh, how are you sure that the UN will be able to get from the decade of biodiversity? It seems everyone has a uh, choice on even binding resolutions. So one is, why hasn't that target been met? 
And the second one is everyone has a choice on the binding resolutions. Comment on that, please. I think two reasons why it has not been met, because it was, it was just adopted at the UN conference, reiterated at all heads of states meeting, including the General Assembly, including the G8 summit, including the group of 77 meetings, but it was left there. So as a declaration, and you cannot transform the reality just on adopting a decision. So therefore it was not translated into a national priorities and plan of action. It was not seen as a national obligation, which is not the case now with these 20, the, this 2020 targets where all the government of the world have agreed to translate them into a national priority. So action takes place at local level, action takes place at national level. The UN is just to facilitate uh, this, uh, this uh, harmonization of decision. So why uh, to achieve, uh, why uh, this UN decade will be different? As you know, we, in the UN, they declare uh, international years or by the international years, UN decade. This one is different because it's not an end by itself. It's not celebrating for the sake of celebrating. It's part and parcel of the commitment taken in Nagoya and Japan into the, a new strategic plan. This is the first target that, the, that the, the international community has agreed to ensure, as I said, that each and every citizen of the world will be at the latest by 2020 aware about biodiversity, will value biodiversity, and will uh, protect biodiversity. And therefore, the UN decade has been uh, proclaimed. And Monique, let's talk about the next decade of biodiversity. How does this get implemented? What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, for us, um, what is going to be important is to keep on uh, protecting more areas uh, on a terrest terrestrial basis. Uh, we are thinking um, a, a very important kind of uh, um, ecosystem that are important like the forest because they also count for climate change. So anything which can count double or help for different purposes are important but I think that uh, as far as GF is concerned we will also do much more into the marine biodiversity uh, again the the wealth of the ocean uh, is certainly uh, very uh, the most important uh, wealth for human, um, for human uh, uh, species and um, we will be doing a lot into fisheries, uh, into uh, protecting oceans against acidifications, those kind of programs which uh, we think that uh, people have not done enough because as you know oceans belong to nobody True. and so when things belong to nobody it becomes the garbage of the world. And that is something that we can't afford uh, anymore uh, today. And that will be our main target. To you, Ahmed, and to you, Monique, thank you so much for being here. Fascinating information, and I'm so glad we chose you folks to be on our program. We Before really we leave, I want to show you this uh, uh, apple, natural apple, grown with the logo of the United Nations Decade on Biodiversity. How nice. As a gift for you. And just to tell you that uh, what uh, this decade will make or defeat the humanity, because what is going to happen in this decade will have tremendous importance for the survival of humanity. Thank you so Thank much. You very, much. very kind. And I'd like to uh, apologize. We got questions from all over the world, and we really do appreciate your watching and sending your questions in. I'm afraid we couldn't get to all of them, but we certainly do appreciate the information that you gave to us. We do appreciate your watching. I'm afraid we've come to the end of the program right now. Now, before we go, there's just time to point out that we have some information for you for more information. To find out more about the CBD and the UN Decade of Biodiversity, go to www.cbd.int. There you go. Uh, we'll also find more information on the strategic goals and targets. Also, feel free to add your comments and thoughts to the Facebook page at www.facebook.com slash UN Biodiversity. And for more information on the Global Environment Facility, please take a look at www.thegef.org. That just leaves time to say thank you to our guests, Ahmed Jogaf and Monique Barbu. Thank you for watching. We really do appreciate it. We'll leave you now with a final thought from UN Goodwill Ambassador for Biodiversity, actor Edward Norton. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my hope as an ambassador for the Convention on Biodiversity is to be a part of the communications mission. Um, and I hope that 
in short order, I won't, I won't be alone. Or I, I think we need, we need lots of people to be ambassadors for biodiversity. We need lots of people to speak um, to this mission, not just scientists. Uh, um, we, need, we need artists and, and politicians and uh, businessmen. Uh, and everybody to talk about the ways that what they do um, uh, interconnect with this mission.